After watching this video till the end, you will be able to understand most of the aspects of Inguna Hernia and you will be able to write long essays and answer most of the Viva questions and solve some related MCQs as well. So watch this video till the end. Before starting this video, if you are a med student, make sure to check out this video on how to study general surgery in med school. But after watching the current video on Inguna Hernia, I am sure some of my strategies might help you out. Note it down in your notes as a reminder to watch this video after completing the current video on inguinal hernia otherwise you might forget it. In this video we will discuss inguinal hernia under the following headings. What is inguinal hernia? So before starting this video please hit the subscribe button so that you will not miss out any of my upcoming videos. Inguinal hernia is an abnormal protrusion of a viscous through an opening which can be natural or artificial opening with a sac covering it. In order to understand this definition of inguinal hernia, we have to discuss about the sac and contents of the inguinal hernia in detail. So inguinal hernia has the following parts. The content which herniates in the inguinal hernia often pushes the structures which are present in the anterior abdominal wall along with it as they herniate and come out. So the structures which are being pushed in front of the contents of the inguinal hernia forms the sac of the hernia. So the major part of the sac is called body. The narrowest part of the sac is called as neck. The opening through which herniation occurs is called as mouth. Sac is usually made of the layers of the abdominal wall which are being pushed forward by the protruding viscera such as the intestines. The contents of hernia can be intestines, omentum, appendix or even urinary bladder and there are many more contents which can possibly herniate as inguinal hernia. Surgical anatomy is the most important area to know about in inguinal hernia. Let us see about the layers of anterior abdominal wall first. The anterior most muscle is external oblique aponeurosis in the abdominal wall. The fibers of this muscle are directed downwards and medially like how we insert our hands in our pant pockets. At the lower most and medial end of the external oblique aponeurosis there is a small triangular defect which is called as superficial inguinal ring. This is present just above and medial to the pubic tubercle and the lowermost part of the external oblique uh, aponeurosis thickens to form a structure which is called as inguinal ligament. Once we remove external oblique muscle we can see another muscle which is present deep to it which is called as internal oblique. This is the next layer. So the muscle fibers of internal oblique muscle are directed upwards and medially which is exactly perpendicular to external oblique muscle. Once we remove internal oblique, the next layer is a muscle which has transversely arranged muscle fibers. So it is called as transversus abdominis. After removing transversus abdominis, we, we find a fascia layer which is called as transversalis fascia. There is a small oval defect about 1.25 cm or half inch above mid inguinal point. This is called as deep inguinal ring. The mid inguinal point is present between the anterior superior iliac spine and pubic symphysis. So inguinal canal is present from the deep inguinal ring which is a defect in fascia transversalis and it extends till the superficial inguinal ring which is a defect in external oblique aponeurosis. Here comes the most important part, boundaries of inguinal canal. The anterior wall is mediated by skin, superficial fascia, external oblique aponeurosis throughout the canal. In later one third of the canal alone there is an additional structure which is forming the anterior wall of the canal. It is the internal oblique muscle. So this is a depiction of inguinal canal uh, along with its boundaries. So you can see that it extends from deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. So a deep inguinal ring is a defect in the transversalis fascia and superficial inguinal ring is a defect in external oblique aponeurosis. As you can see that throughout the extent of the canal you can see that the external oblique aponeurosis forms the anterior boundary whereas in the lateral one third alone you can see that there is a muscle which forms the anterior boundary. It is internal oblique muscle. Now let us see about the posterior wall of inguinal canal. Throughout the posterior wall, we have fascia transversalis, which is a structure which is present posterior to transversus abdominis muscle. And behind fascia transversalis, we have extra peritoneal tissue. And behind extra peritoneal tissue, we have parietal peritoneum. In the medial two third of the canal alone, there is an extra structure which is present posteriorly. It is the conjoint tendon. The conjoint tendon is formed by combination of the tendons of internal oblique muscle and transversus abdominis muscle. So again, the same picture. Here you can see that. Throughout the posterior wall you can see presence of fascia transversalis. So behind fascia transversalis you have to imagine that there is presence of some fatty tissue which is extra peritoneal tissue and behind that we have the parietal peritoneum and 
in the medial two-third alone, you can see that the uh, conjoint tendon is present posterior to the inguinal canal. So that forms the posterior boundary of the inguinal canal, the medial two-third alone. So that is about the posterior boundary. Now about the roof and floor of inguinal canal. The roof is formed by the arched fibers. So the fibers are going to arch, okay? The arched fibers of internal oblique muscle and transverse abdominis muscle. Whereas the floor is formed by inguinal ligament. As we know already, inguinal ligament is an extension of external oblique upon uresis. So here you can see that superiorly we have transverse abdominis muscle and internal oblique muscle, uh, which are the arched fibers. That is very important to mention. And the floor is formed by the inguinal ligament, which is a continuation of external oblique upon uresis. And as you can see here, the content of inguinal canal, which is spermatic cord in males. If you want to know about spermatic cord structures in detail in just one minute, make sure to check out the link in the description of this video after watching this video. Contents of inguinal canal. There are certain structures which extend all the way from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. So in males, it is spermatic cord. So the spermatic cord is going to enter from the abdominal cavity through the deep inguinal ring. It enters the inguinal canal and it passes all the way across the inguinal canal and leaves the inguinal canal to the superficial inguinal ring and enters the scrotum of the males. So whereas in females, the structure which is present from the deep ring to the superficial ring is raudal ligament of uterus, which is a remnant structure. So there is another structure which is called ilio inguinal nerve. So it is not going to enter the inguinal canal through deep inguinal ring. It is going to pass, it is going to enter the inguinal canal through the muscles which are present in the anterior abdominal wall. And it is just going to enter the inguinal canal through them and it will pass out of the inguinal canal through the superficial inguinal ring. So it passes only through the superficial inguinal ring. So this is a depiction of the contents of inguinal canal. Here you can see that the spermatic cord passes from the deep inguinal ring all the way through the inguinal canal and exits out of the superficial inguinal ring whereas the ilio inguinal nerve enters in between the canal through the muscles which are present in the, abdo in the abdominal wall and it leaves the canal through the superficial inguinal ring. Now before we see about the types of inguinal hernia, we have to know about an important triangle which is called as Hasselbach triangle and its boundaries which is very very important to know. It is bounded medially by the lateral border of rectus abdominis muscle, laterally by an artery which is called inferior epigastric artery and inferiorly by inguinal ligament. If inguinal hernia occurs medial to the inferior epigastric artery, which is inside the Hasselbach triangle, it is called as direct type of inguinal hernia. Whereas if it occurs outside the Hasselbach triangle or lateral to the inferior epigastric artery, it is called as indirect type of inguinal hernia. Now let us see some differences between direct and indirect inguinal hernia. Direct inguinal hernia is going to occur medial to inferior epigastric artery, whereas indirect inguinal hernia is going to occur lateral to inferior epigastric artery. A direct inguinal hernia occurs through defect in the weak abdominal musculature, like in old age people and in people with collagen defects, whereas indirect inguinal hernia occurs through the deep inguinal ring. Usually, there are low risk of complications in direct inguinal hernia because of a wider neck, whereas indirect inguinal hernia has high risks of complications like strangulation because the neck is usually narrow. Let us see about the etiology or causes for inguinal hernia. It is common in old age people because naturally the muscles in the anterior abdominal wall are going to weaken and this can lead to occurrence of inguinal hernia. Smoking can also predispose for the development of inguinal hernia by affecting the normal production of collagen and also it can predispose to the development of chronic cough which can increase the intra abdominal pressure leading to development of inguinal hernia. It is also common in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease abbreviated as COPD because they also have chronic cough and the mechanism is same and patients with chronic constipation also tend to have increased intraabdominal pressure because of prolonged straining and they can also develop inguinal hernia and old men with urinary difficulties like those with benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH are also prone to develop inguinal hernia because of increased intraabdominal pressure. The patients with inguinal hernia usually present with a lump in the groin and usually painless, but in some cases, mild dull aching pain might be there. In certain cases, inguinal hernia can get complicated, where there can be development of incarceration, which means the hernia becomes stuck and irreducible. And if it prolongs in this stage, there can be intestinal obstruction, which can lead to obstipation. So there'll be difficulty in passing stools. And if this prolongs, there can be perforation of the bowel wall leading to sepsis and other complications. So if this prolongs, there can be strangulation because of impaired blood supply of the bowel. So prolonged strangulation can cause gangrene of the bowel and because of gangrene it can serve as a source of infection and it can cause sepsis and very worse complications. Now 
we are going to see about the most important part of inguinal hernia which is clinical examination the most important things which your examiner is going to expect from you in your exams is clinical examination and if you mess up in any demonstration things might not go well for you from that so make sure to pay proper attention to each and everything which i'm going to tell from now first of all make sure to obtain consent from the patient and explain them what you're going to do and with their permission expose the patient from umbilicus to mid thigh this is very important we are going to do the examination of a patient with inguinal hernia in two positions. First, we will see the patient in standing position and then we will perform certain tests in supine position. Examination is done under the following headings. First, inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation. First, in inspection, we will see the swelling and note down certain characteristics of the swelling. And then we will see the skin changes which are occurring over the swelling and presence of cough impulse and position of the penis so about the swelling first thing which you're going to describe is the size and shape of the swelling if it is an indirect inguinal hernia it is usually piriform in shape because the swelling is going to pass all the way from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring and then it enters the scrotum so it is going to take the shape of the canal and becomes piriform in shape whereas in direct inguinal hernia it, it is going to occur just through weakness in the anterior abdominal wall musculature so it is just going to be spherical in shape Another thing you are going to see about the swelling is the position and extent. As I told already, indirect inguinal hernia is going to extend from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. Whereas direct inguinal hernia is going to present just above, just over the superficial inguinal ring, not extending from the deep inguinal ring. And in certain cases, if you observe carefully, you can note the presence of visible peristalsis because the content is intestines in most of the cases. The next thing you are going to note is presence of certain skin changes such as presence of scar which might give a clue that there was history of previous hernia surgery in the patient or other abdominal surgery such as appendicectomy or any other surgeries in the past which can predispose to the development of hernia again in this patient and also you should observe the pre presence of certain skin changes such as erythema or, erythema or reddish discoloration over the swelling which might indicate presence of infection or active inflammation. The next step is observing cough impulse. Here you are going to ask the patient to turn the head away from you and ask the patient to cough. By doing so you are going to observe the presence of an expansive swelling at the site of groin and in certain patients the hernia swelling will be visible only during coughing and straining maneuvers. So if the hernia swelling is hidden it can be revealed with the help of cough impulse test and you can also observe the position of penis when there is very large inguinal hernia swellings the penis can be pushed away from the swelling. So that can be observed in certain patients. We have completed inspection and we are going to start palpation. As we do with any other swelling in the body, the first thing which you are going to do is note the presence of tenderness or local rise in temperature over the swelling. Tenderness is elicited by gently palpating over the swelling and observing the facial expression changes of the patient if there is presence of pain or not. And you can compare the local rise in temperature by palpating the temperature over the swelling and in other sides of the body to compare. Uh, the presence of local rise of temperature because of complications like infection or inflammation. Now we have to confirm the position and extent which we observed in inspection with the help of palpation. If a swelling extends from the inguinal canal into the scrotum, it is inguinal hernia. If the swelling is present in groin alone and not extending into the scrotum, it can be either inguinal hernia or femoral hernia. So how to differentiate them? If the swelling is present above and medial to the pubic tubercle, which is the site of superficial inguinal ring, it is inguinal hernia. If the swelling is occurring below and lateral to the pubic tubercle, it is mostly femoral hernia. That is how we can differentiate direct inguinal hernia from femoral hernia. Another thing which you can see is if you can get above the swelling. So in inguinal hernia, the swelling is usually inguinoscrotal swelling because, because the hernial content is coming all the way from the inguinal canal and entering into the scrotum. So if you try to trace above the swelling, it is not possible to get above the swelling at the, at the root of scrotum because the content of the hernia is going to continue into the inguinal canal. So you won't be able to get above the swelling. Whereas in case of hydrocele, which is purely scrotal swelling, it will be possible to get above the swelling because the swelling is just in the scrotum. So if you're going to trace the swelling above, you'll be able to find a top of the swelling, which is not continuous with the inguinal canal. So this can help you to differentiate between inguinal hernia and hydrocele. So after watching this video completely, you can check out my other video on hydrocele. The link will be provided in the end of the video. 
The next thing you must see is consistency of the swelling by palpation. If the swelling is doughy and granular, it can be omentum because it is fatty tissue. Whereas if the content is elastic, it can be intestines. And the other thing you should see is relation of the swelling to testis and spermatic cord. Inguinal hernia is usually present in front and on side of the testis and spermatic cord structures. Cough impulse test. Here we are going to see the presence of complications like incarceration, strangulation, etc. If no swelling is visible just on inspection, place a finger on the superficial inguinal ring which is present above and medial to the pubic tubercle and ask the patient to cough. You will find an expansive cough impulse on the superficial inguinal ring. If the swelling is clearly present, hold the root of the scrotum between thumb and index finger and ask the patient to cough. So there also you can see presence of an expansive cough impulse. So your finger is going to move away, thumb and index finger is going to move away because of uh, the expansive cough impulse. So that is going to help you know that there are no complications like irreducibility or incarceration. There is a modification of cough impulse test which is called as Z-man technique also known as three finger test because here we are going to use three fingers to perform this test. So first we are going to place the index finger on the deep ring which is present 1.25 cm above the median inguinal point. The next middle finger is placed over superficial inguinal ring. The ring finger is placed over the saphenous opening. The saphenous opening is present 4 cm below and 4 cm lateral to pubic tubercle. So these three fingers are placed after reducing the inguinal hernia swelling and then we are going to ask the patient to turn their head away from you and cough. So you are going to see where the impulse cough impulse is felt like at which finger. If the impulse is felt in the index finger, it means the patient has indirect inguinal hernia because we have placed our finger over the deep inguinal ring which is the place from which indirect inguinal hernia originates. If the impulse is felt in the middle finger, it means that the patient has direct inguinal hernia. If the impulse is present directly in the ring finger, it means that we are feeling the impulse in the saphenous opening which is the site from which femoral hernia occurs. So this is a test which can help you to differentiate between indirect versus direct inguinal hernia versus femoral hernia. Another thing which you should see in palpation is the swelling is reducible or irreducible. In most of the cases the patients can themselves reduce the swelling by themselves and in some cases you can reduce the swelling manually by gentle pressure. If the swelling cannot be reduced it can be incarcerated or obstructed or strangulated. So an important thing is if the swelling cannot be reduced by yourself or by the patient Forceful reduction should never be done. There's a maneuver called taxis where you ask the patient to flex the thigh and adduct the thigh medially and thereby it will be easier for reduction of the swelling. But taxis is absolutely contraindicated because what can happen is that this patient might have a strangulated hernia which is undergoing gangrene. If you are going to push back this gangrenous bubble into the abdominal cavity, it will be difficult to identify this gangrenous bubble during surgery. So the surgeon might miss out the presence of gangrenous bubble and just close the hernial defect with the mesh and the surgery will be completed. There will be ongoing gangrene inside the patient and this can cause sepsis and for severe complications. So you should have in mind that taxis should never be done in an irreducible hernia patient. The next test is invagination test. This can be performed when the patient is in supine position. You can use your little finger or index finger based on your comfort and invaginate gently in the superficial inguinal ring. The finger is directed in the direction of the inguinal canal. Once you have invaginated in the superficial ring, ask the patient to cough. Look where the impulse is felt. Like in this picture you can see that the finger is directed along the inguinal canal. So the tip of the finger will be facing in the direction of inguinal canal whereas the pulp of the finger will be facing the anterior abdominal wall. So if the impulse is felt in the tip of the finger, it means that it is indirect inguinal hernia because indirect inguinal hernia comes from the deep ring and it is going to hit the tip of the finger whereas direct hernia comes from the anterior abdominal wall defect and it is going to hit the pulp of the finger which is present anteriorly. So this is another test which can help you to differentiate between direct and indirect inguinal hernia but make sure to do it gently. Ring occlusion test. This test is done in standing position. First, the hernia is reduced by either the patient or by yourself. Do not do this test if the swelling is irreducible. Then the deep ring is occluded with a thumb. The deep ring is present 1.25 cm above the mid-inguinal point. So once you have occluded the deep inguinal ring, you are occluding the site of origin of indirect inguinal hernia and now you ask the patient to cough. Once the patient coughs, if the swelling appears, it, it means that it is direct inguinal hernia. 
because you are occluding the deep inguinal ring which is the site of origin of indirect inguinal hernia so you can get an idea that this is direct inguinal hernia whereas if the swelling does not appear it can suggest that it is an indirect inguinal hernia because you are occluding the site of origin of indirect inguinal hernia now we are going to do percussion we are going to percuss over the inguinal swelling it can give us a clue regarding the content of the hernia so it can help us to differentiate if the content is intestine or omentum if on percussion you hear resonant note it means that the content can be intestine whereas if you if on percussion you hear dull note it means the content can be fat or omentum the next step is auscultation so if the content of hernia is intestines you can hear bowel sounds in certain cases by placing the step on the hernial swelling now we have learnt about examination of a patient with inguinal hernia now let us see about the treatment of inguinal hernia the mainstay of treatment in inguinal hernia is surgery conservative management can be done in certain patients like old age groups if the hernia is spontaneously reducible and there are no complications currently but these patients should be educated about the danger signs of complications such as obstipation due to bowel obstruction and severe pain which can occur due to strangulation so that they can seek immediate medical attention first let us see about the surgical principles in inguinal hernia surgery we have to reduce the hernial contents back into the abdominal cavity while reducing make sure that the reduced content is viable and if there are any infarcted non viable tissues make sure to remove them we also have to remove the excess sac of the hernia or in some cases it can be replaced back inside the abdominal cavity and then the defect through which the herniation occurs has to be closed it can be done using mesh or sutures which will help us to reinforce the posterior wall of the abdominal wall and thereby preventing recurrence of hernia the various surgeries which can be done for inguinal hernia are herniotomy open suture repair which can be bassini repair shoulder repair open mesh repair done with the help of meshes which is lichtenstein repair we can also use hernia plugs in some cases and the recent advancements which are laparoscopic re repairs there are two techniques in laparoscopic repairs which is tap and tap we'll see about them in detail herniotomy is a procedure where the hernial contents are reduced back into the abdominal cavity and the excess sac of the inguinal hernia is removed and the defect is closed so this can be done in children in whom the cause is usually the presence of patent processus vaginalis to know about processus vaginalis in detail make sure to watch my video on hydrocele where i have explained about processus vaginalis and how it can predispose to the development of congenital hydrocele and congenital hernia herniotomy alone is however not sufficient for adults because of the increased risk of recurrence now let us see about open suture repair techniques one of the pioneers of hernia surgeries is bassini repair let us see about the important steps of bassini repair first the anterior wall is opened and the spermatic cord is separated from the sac of hernia the contents of the hernial sac are checked if they are viable if they are viable they are pushed back into the abdomen or if they are infarcted they have to be removed and necessary bowel correct bowel corrective surgeries has to be done and then the excess sac can be removed and the and the sac is sutured at the neck the additional thing which we are going to do in bassini repair is strengthening of the posterior wall that is done by suturing the conjoint tendon and in inguinal ligament together okay so this conjoint tendon is going to be sutured with inguinal ligament all the way from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring thereby the posterior wall of the inguinal canal is strengthened now there is a modification for bassini repair which is called as shoulder repair the initial steps of shoulder repair are similar to bassini repair the posterior most layer of the abdominal wall which we saw as transversalis fascia is going to be incised so it is going to be cut and then it is going to be sutured as two layers as shown in the depiction in the picture it will it will lead to production of more stronger posterior abdominal wall so this is called as double breasting technique so this leads to strengthening of posterior wall and decreases the chances of recurrence of hernia to a greater extent and just like how we closed the transversalis fascia with the help of double breasting technique same thing is done for external oblique muscle also so shoulder repair is associated with less chances of recurrence of hernia after surgery as compared to bassini repair now we are going to see about mesh repair this is one of the most common techniques which are currently being done in recent times so the name of the surgery is lichtenstein tension free open mesh plasty so here the the initial steps are same like in previous surgeries like we are going to do herniotomy here so the contents of the hernial sac are going to be reduced back in the abdominal cavity and then the excess sac is removed but the difference here is that we are going to use a mesh 
So what is the purpose of this mesh and why is this surgery named as tension free? That is because this mesh is going to be placed on the posterior wall of inguinal canal and this mesh is going to be sutured to inguinal ligament above and conjoint tendon below. If you compare this with Bassini repair, what we did there, we sutured the conjoint tendon with inguinal ligament. So we're going to pull the conjoint tendon downwards and suture it with inguinal ligament that is going to create more tension and this can give away if the patient is going to put more exertion and can lead to recurrence of hernia. But here there is no tension because we are not going to tie the inguinal ligament conjoint tendon forcefully so there is no tension. Instead we are putting a mesh between the inguinal ligament and conjoint tendon and suturing the mesh with the conjoint tendon above and in, uh, the mesh with the inguinal ligament below and thereby we are covering the defect. One of the important principles of mesh repair is that, is that there should be minimum overlap of about 2 cm around all the margins of the defect for decreasing the chances of recurrence. Most important advantages of Lichtenstein tension free open mesh plastic technique is there is low recurrence compared to open suture techniques like Bassini or Scholdi's and there is also comparatively early post-op recovery in these patients. Hernia plugs or mesh plugs which can be used to close small defects in the abdominal wall so it is not beneficial for patients with larger defects. Now let us see about laparoscopic repairs. There are two important techniques in laparoscopic repair of inguinal hernia. They are TEP and TAP. The expansion for TEP is totally extraperitoneal repair whereas the expansion for TAP is transabdominal preperitoneal repair. Usually TEP is preferred over TAP. In laparoscopic repairs what we are going to do is we are going to use a large mesh and it is placed deep to the abdominal wall and it is going to extend across the midline to cross to the opposite side also. So the mesh is going to cover important areas like Hasselbeck triangle, deep ring and femoral canal. So we are covering all the possible sites of hernia. Now let us see about differences between TEP and TAP. As the name suggests, in TEP we need not enter the peritoneal cavity. It is totally extra peritoneal procedure. So it is just an anterior approach and we are going to reach the extra peritoneal space and place our mesh there. Whereas in TAP, as the name suggests, it is trans abdominal procedure. So here the peritoneal cavity or the abdominal cavity has to be entered and then we reach the extra peritoneal space and then we place the mesh there. So that is the difference between TEP and TAP. Hit the subscribe button right now so that you can watch all my upcoming simplified videos like this and you will not miss out any of them and get notified as soon as I upload them. Check out all these other 1 minute hernia videos if you need an extra edge in exams and make sure to subscribe to skeleton channel after watching those 1 minute hernia videos to help me to make more videos. If you also want to learn about hydrocyl, the link will be provided in the description of this video. As I told already, if you want to know my tips and tricks about how to study general surgery in med school, make sure to check out this video. The link will be in the description. Lecture slides for this video will be available in the description below. You can download it for free or you can also download it after supporting my channel by buying me a coffee on the link in the description below. You can watch more of my general surgery lecture videos by clicking the link you see on the screen right here. Before that hit the subscribe button so we won't miss out each other. And if you are someone who likes study with me videos, please make sure to check out my channel study with Tony and use these videos to study well for your exams. Thank you so much for watching this video till the end. Keep learning with Medwits Made Simple and my other channels. Meanwhile, I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.